Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. Today's episode is the next in our In Their Own Words oral history series, in which we talk with scientists who have made great contributions to their fields, particularly in the biological sciences. This week's guest is Dr. John Burris, who is Emeritus President of the Burroughs Welcome Fund. He's also a past president of AIBS. Dr. Burris, thank you very much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. I look forward to chatting. I look forward to it as well. And our first prompt is, um, when did you first know that you wanted to work in the life sciences? Um, just as all things start when one is young, um, but just by way of background, my father uh, was a professor of biochemistry at the University of Wisconsin. And my mother had a master's in nutrition. And so the setting the environment in which I grew up was a very strongly science-oriented environment. So that was sort of a background at all times, or from day one, so to speak. Um, I think it was really crystallized by two summers that I spent, one after my sophomore year in high school and the other after my junior year in high school. At that time, the National Science Foundation had these programs called uh, of science for uh, high school students. I'm sure there's a more formal name. But what they were, and they were a wonderful experience, this uh, first one was at the uh, Cape Hayes Marine Lab in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, and that was, you have to realize, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and so the opportunity to spend a summer uh, studying uh, marine life in Florida was uh, an amazing one. And the programs were, were super good programs. The one at Cape Hayes uh, involved, there were 11 of us. We lived together in a motel, and then every day we took classes and then did research at Cape Hayes. And Cape Hayes was a small marine lab, uh, and its specialty was sharks. Pretty exotic for a sophomore in high school from Wisconsin. And the leader of the lab was a very famous woman, Eugenie Clark, who had written a book, Lady with a Spear, and she had worked on shark research. And so um, we not only learned all about the marine life and, and went to classes, but we went out on the boat and, believe it or not, caught sharks and then brought the sharks back if they were tried to keep them alive for behavioral studies, if not dissected them. Uh, so spending eight weeks uh, studying marine life uh, was pretty strong reinforcement for wanting to be a scientist. Uh, you have to realize that this is the era of Jacques Cousteau. That would have probably been the summer of 1964 that I did that, and this is when everybody was excited about Cousteau and the oceans. And then the following summer, uh, I went to another NSF program at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, and that was uh, very interesting because Scripps was a part of UCSD. UCSD was basically in its infancy, and in we lived in a college dormitory. Uh, that program was a little larger, 20-plus uh, kids, but we took classes and then were assigned uh, to do research. And uh, I was assigned to uh, or chose to do research with a plankton expert, John McGowan, who was a professor at uh, Scripps, and then... Uh, one of his graduates, two of his graduate students, a fellow named Charlie Miller and Pete Wiebe. And so um, not only did we <laughs> sit on the beach every day, but uh, I went on a two-week cruise to Baja, California. So it's sort of hard when you're exposed at an age like that to two experiences like that, not to say, I want to be a scientist. So I'd always wanted to be a scientist, and this reinforced it. I went to uh, college and majored in biology, did the sort of normal lab stuff. Summer after my junior year in college, I spent the summer at a marine lab in Finland and studied that when I worked as an independent investigator. I think they weren't quite sure what to make of this American college student that came over, and so I got a lab and, and studied vertical migration and zooplankton in Finland. And uh, so the hook had been set, so it was pretty certain. I, I just loved science and was intrigued by it. And was one of these 
fortunate people that were put in an environment that just reinforced it. And um, so that was, it was pretty clear. Uh, and that's not to say I couldn't have deviated from the path, but it was pretty certain and I just enjoyed it. Uh, I spent a year in, at the University of Wisconsin after graduating uh, in an MD PhD program, decided I really wanted a PhD, not an MD. So I went to um, graduate school at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla. And that's where I got my PhD. So by, of course, by the time you're getting a PhD, you're pretty certain you want to be a scientist. But uh, mine is not a very twisted path. It's a pretty straight path to science. So I'm curious, what uh, what sparked uh, that brief urge to pursue an MD? What, um, what was what were you thinking about at that time? Well, this was at the height of the Vietnam War and student protest. I graduated from college in 1971. We'd had one and a half year uh, where they'd actually, at the end of the year, sent all the students home, and there was an enormous amount of protest. And there was a lot of... Um, feeling and I was part of it that you wanted to be relevant you wanted to do good and I mean that in a positive way and so medicine uh, seemed to be a natural place for me to go but I was in an MD PhD program so I always was interested in in uh, doing research with a medical bent and figured that that an MD would be helpful I still think to this day to some extent of course an MD does give you uh, some advantages in terms of research on uh, humans and and sort of being in the forefront of understanding what diseases are relevant and, and also uh, human suffering in the sense of that. So that it was an MD-PhD program, and I didn't do much of the MD part of it. I, I actually, at Wisconsin, took a bunch of limnology courses and realized that really my interest was much more in that end of things. Wisconsin had a very strong limnology department at that time with uh, John Magnuson and Art Hassler. So it was sort of something that uh, intrigued me. And then that offered the opportunity to then to go on to Scripps. And, uh, but I think that was a sort of the social environment uh, of 1970, 71, 72. I mean, people that were alive then. <laughs> uh, we'll certainly remember that if they were college students. That makes sense to me. So um, after your graduate studies, um, you know, what, what came next in your career? How did you get that first job? You know, I was very lucky. I did not have to do a postdoc, and that was nice. I got a job at Penn State. Uh, they advertised for a botanist, and I didn't know much about plants, but I knew a lot about photosynthesis because my research as a graduate student was on uh, photorespiration in uh, marine algae and primarily studied the zooxanthellae, the unicellular dinoflagellates that live inside corals and looked at the symbiosis between the two of them. And, and I had had two, I had had a cruise, uh, a couple of cruises, but one was to the Great Barrier Reef in which I spent eight weeks anchored on an island off the reef and looked at coral symbiosis. And so that gave me a reasonable feel for plants because I was looking at photosynthesis and photorespiration. So I got a job at Penn State uh, <laughs> as a, a plant ecologist. And I guess that was a rather broad definition of what I'd done, but uh, I ended up teaching introductory ecology and introductory botany, so I think I learned that hopefully as much as some students or at least a little bit more, but I was just very lucky. I published some papers and had, uh, had a reasonable success as a graduate student, and I was able to get a job right away as an assistant professor, so uh, moved to State College, Pennsylvania, uh, right as right as I finished my PhD in 1976. Okay, and if you don't mind, I'd like to take you back uh, for just a moment to that, you know, that Great Barrier Reef. That was eight weeks anchored just off the reef or on the reef? Well, we there's there are a series of uh, islands that are called continental islands, um, just 30-some oh, miles, I guess, offshore, uh, with reefs around them. Great Barrier Reef is huge and stretches forever. 
And this was an island called Lizard Island. And it, it was really a neat place. At that time, nobody was there. There was a hermit lived on the island, but that was it. It's now, a, uh, I haven't been back, but it's now a luxury resort. But we were there, we had this island in it, a, a, a mountain that supposedly Cook had climbed to uh, help chart his way through the the passages of the reef. And, and uh, it was an Alpha Helix cruise. The Alpha Helix was a National Science Foundation ship that was operated by Scripps. And, but the, the expeditions were not necessarily Scripps-based expeditions. They were uh, scientists supplied to NSF and, and a professor, a fellow named it, Ed Tolbert at the at Michigan State had set up this cruise, and and so I was fortunate to be on that cruise um, as a graduate student. And my major professor was also on the cruise. And uh, interestingly enough, my father was on the cruise. My dad was uh, the chief scientist <laughs> for the expedition. Had been a graduate student of my father's. So my dad went and he studied nitrogen fixation on the reef, not much of that had been done before, and he had developed along with some of his postdocs and visiting scientists, something called the acetylene reduction method. And that's a way to look at acetylene reduction as a measure of nitrogen fixation. It didn't require N15 isotope, which is the way that uh, had been the, the only other way really to do it. And he'd, he'd done that forever. He had built a mass spec and you know, himself in the 1940s and had studied with Harold Urey, who was the Nobel Prize winner at Columbia and had, who discovered uh, the heavy isotope of water. And so he had, my dad had gone to Columbia, postdoc learning about N15, came back to Wisconsin as a professor and built a mass spec and measured N15. So he was uh, the guru of nitrogen fixation. I mean, he was a member of the National Academy of Sciences and National Medal of Science winner, et cetera, but it was fun to have him on the cruise. It was sort of out of his environment, the marine environment, but uh, it was nice to have him along on the cruise also. Yeah, that, sound, that does sound enjoyable. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, is there a lot of cross-pollination of ideas, um, you know, among the various researchers who work on quite clearly a diversity of different topics, um, you know, in those kinds of settings? Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, the cruise was fun because there are a lot of, as I said, uh, different people, terrestrial scientists, one from Georgia and, and from uh, uh, Michigan State and all over. And I ended up collaborating with a scientist, uh, Clanton Black, who was at the University of Georgia, who I probably would not have ever had any cross-pollination or ever or very limited interactions with, but you're on there somebody's doing a fun project or something interesting and you may be able to bring um, isotope knowledge or you may be able to uh, provide some thoughts on the enzymes and uh, it, it's the alpha helix was set up very specifically for what you have alluded to which was an area for a group of scientists to physically work together and we had almost daily uh, seminars in which people would talk about what their research was, you know, just informal talks. So you'd know what A, B, or C was doing. And then uh, you sort of take it from there. You say, oh, wow, that's, a, that's interesting. That's kind of like what I'm seeing. And then we would go out together in the field. And uh, there was a scientist from UCLA, Len Muscatine, who was really sort of the, the expert coral biologist. And, uh, he sort of would, would help everyone learn more about the natural environment and then all these biochemists, because for the most part they were biochemists and on the, on the trip would uh, bring the ideas and say, well, maybe if we do this, this, or this. So it, everyone who had been on a Helix cruise, and you'll cross paths with them, I suspect, a little bit. The, there was a very famous scientist, Per Scholander, who was sort of the father of the Alpha Helix in terms of setting it up, we'll all say it was one of the most productive times that they ever had because they were on this ship. And uh, in our case, the ship was anchored off this island. And so it was really literally a floating laboratory without even the distractions 
of being at sea and steaming and all that sort of stuff, which takes a lot of time when you're an oceanographer to go from A to B to C. None of that was the case. We all were on the, on the cruise. And it was both Americans and Australians, which was very nice. So that was good to have Australian scientists involved because, again, that's a group uh, one would have had very little contact with. Yeah, and I think that's you know that's an interesting thing, um, and it kind of feeds into you know one of our other questions, which is you know how have things uh, changed over the course of your career? But that certainly sounds like one uh, you know in terms of the ability to do collaboration. I'm, I'm guessing that um, you know talking to Australian scientists in you know the 1970s would be something that would have to be conducted over a telephone and a shaky international line at best, um, whereas now it's probably quite different. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and up to the physical contact. I mean, you know, we go diving and collect a specimen for someone to use in an experiment. I mean, you really, it, it's, it's like a cauldron of ideas and organisms and uh, all sort of mixed together and you're not going anywhere. I mean, <laughs> maybe people say, well, that's, but for 24 seven, you're together. I mean, we could go, you can take, you could take a skiff on shore if you wanted you could hike around a little bit on the island or go but basically there you are <laughs> so it was good and and uh my uh it was just a good opportunity to interact it, it does sound so um so why don't you tell me a little bit about um your time uh, at penn state you know what was that what was that era like and what sorts of things were you working on so penn state um was and is a very large university and it's kind of interesting because Scripps didn't have any undergraduates. It was an all, they were all graduate students. There were undergraduates on the upper campus at UCSD, but you didn't have to do any teaching. You, you know, you got paid as an RA, research assistant. Uh, I made a, an effort to TA one term in an introductory botany course up on the upper campus. So I had a little experience, but you sort of land at Penn State and I still remember my first class, there were 396 students, and there were 396 students because that was the largest lecture room <laughs> at Penn State. So uh, I sort of was uh, plopped down in front of them. And uh, so I learned a lot of botany and a lot of ecology very quickly. Uh, uh, and then, the, the, <laughs> so it was a sort of standard uh teaching research uh, situation where you had to teach introductory courses. And with time, I was able to teach the uh, more advanced classes, but I started out teaching the big introductory ecology and introductory botany class, and then um, built up a lab. I mean, it was one of those, you got a little bit of money to start up, pretty standard in terms of how research still works, except whereas today scientists in the biomedical fields, at least start with a million dollar startup. I think mine was probably more like $40,000. But I set up a lab and then I started to recruit graduate students. And, and then as now, uh, you are told up front, you're going to be judged on publications and grants. And your teaching is something you have to do and you have to do well, but it's not going to, you're not going to get tenure from it. You have to published in grants, so I sort of knew the system, and so you just dive in, and I was very lucky um, to get some really good undergraduates initially. Penn State has a has a very diverse population of kids from the state of Pennsylvania, it's sort of the institution, the default institution that uh, Pennsylvania's uh, young people go to, and so some really terrific uh, undergraduates, and then with time, work to build up more graduate students, but it was a pretty standard career path for anyone which was <laughs> publish, <laughs> get funded, and I got uh, I got a nice grant, a couple of nice grants from NSF, and that was really important because I could support graduate students. And with one of the grants, I went back to the Great Barrier Reef as the chief scientist, not on the Alpha Helix, on a boat that... Um, we chartered from New Zealand uh, and spent eight weeks, uh, again, not just on Lizard, but a series of spots on the reef. And that one was fun because I was able to put the, the crew of scientists together myself, and I thought it was 
it was a very productive um, time, and we had a, a most of the issue, most of an issue of uh, a journal, and and so that was very helpful in my career. So that sounds incredibly rewarding. I'm I'm wondering then, you know, um, what feeds into the decision to uh, you know, step away from that, you know, kind of traditional academic role. And, you know, how do you find yourself at the National Research Council? Sure. Um, that was sort of an interesting story. I, I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed the research, but I also enjoyed um, policy and interacting with people, et cetera. So I went to, <laughs> I went to a garden party. The Academy each year has what's called a garden party where the members come and they bring guests. And so uh, I drove up from State College with my wife and uh, up to D.C. and met my parents there at the garden party. And I was talking to someone and telling him what I was doing. And he said, well, they're starting a new board at the National Research Council called the Board on Basic Biology. And that might be something that would work for you with some sort of talk tonight. So I was intrigued and I applied. And so my year after I got tenure, I went to D.C. in this job with the thought that um, if I liked it, I would stay. If I didn't like it, uh, I would go back to uh, State College. But I loved it. And um, it was really what intrigued me. Fascinating. We are working right away in the first year on a variety of things, a big study of a whole field of biology uh, a committee chaired by Peter Raven, who I'm sure you know. And, and almost overnight, I got to meet everybody in the field uh, from uh, whole organism people like Peter and Tom Eisner to uh, Francisco Ayala, the, a long list. And, and this new board uh, flourished. Uh, a very nice fellow, Art Kelman, who was a plant pathologist at Wisconsin, was the chair of the board, and I, I loved it. So I uh, severed the golden handcuffs, made a decision that I was going to leave the world of research and uh, go into policy, and the academy at that time was a, a great place to do it, and I got a lot of support, and mostly just fascinating, interesting people. I mean, just great stuff. Uh, and I uh, had a wonderful board with lots of uh, support from them, and a whole bunch of fun studies came to the board. Uh, we are, our board put on a joint symposium with the Smith Smithsonian called the Biodiversity, and that actually is where the word was coined, was the title of that. Uh, one of the staff officers, Walt Rosen, came up with it, and, and uh, Ed Wilson uh, compiled the book called Biodiversity. And I mean, it was a, to see a word go from biological diversity to biodiversity and uh, become such a part of the language. And uh, it worked a lot with Peter. And as you well know, because I'm sure you've interviewed Peter, I think you did, in fact, he's, a, he's an enthusiastic, uh, interesting fellow. Uh, then uh, along the line, I ended up being the study director of a study looking at mapping and sequencing the human genome, and Bruce Alberts chaired it, and uh, on that committee was Jim Watson and Dan Nathans, and for a while, Wally Gilbert and Sidney Brenner, and those were just the Nobel Prize winners. And it was just, and we made a recommendation that we, the government should map and sequence the human genome. And two weeks later, NIH started the Human Genome Initiative. So it, it's probably the one time in one's life where one makes a recommendation, <laughs> someone picks up the recommendation, and now, uh, let's see, that was 85, 6, somewhere in there. 35 years later, they're sequencing every virus that comes down the line. But you have to realize that back when we did the study, there was a lot of opposition to it. It was felt that it was uh, just repetitive work and uh, not that important, and there were lots of skeptics about it. Uh, and ultimately, it's they, they think nothing of sequencing a genome, but 
keep in mind, people got Nobel Prizes for for four base pair sequences uh, versus, you know, what we do now. So it just repeated things of that sort. I did a study on use of laboratory animals. And then I moved up to head of the commission on life sciences. And in that portfolio was all the follow-up on the uh, atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, and we ran the U.S. end of that. In fact, the Academy, Truman had put the Academy in charge of the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission back in the, uh, when he became president in the 40s. Uh, and so that involved learning all about radiation and uh, going to Japan, because we part of the Radiation Effects Research Foundation funding came from the U.S. and the other half from the Japanese. So there are a whole host of wonderful things, and that was much too long an answer to a short question. So maybe I'll let you <laughs> go next. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, th- that's, you know, um, it sounds like very exciting stuff and, and a real diversity of topics. Is that one of the, you know, major appeals of, of this type of work is that you're able to, you know, kind of uh, move to one topic and then explore it in depth, and, the, and but then move to something completely different, more or less, you know? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, if you track what I've done in, in my career, you'll see that uh, the last, I just retired from the, the fund where I worked for 11 years, but every job before that had been eight years long. And each one uh, provided a set of just intriguing things and different. I've always liked working with people. Uh, I've enjoyed all the opportunities and it's not that I get bored. It's just that I've come to find things that are very different and, and very different life experiences. And, and so I've fortunately had a family that's tolerated a number of moves and willingness to live in different places um, and seems to have survived fine from it. So uh, I think when opportunities come, as I said earlier about tenure being golden handcuffs, I think if you have a chance and something looks interesting, you should see what you see as the merits and demerits of it, but be willing to try new things because certainly from my perspective, all these different things have been both rewarding and fun. Okay, and I remember it was shortly after this era that you were the president of AIBS, Um, but at the same time you were doing that, you were at Woods Hole, correct? That's right. I went to the Marine Biological Lab in 1992. So I had been at Penn State, and then I went to the Academy. Yeah, I went to Woods Hole in 92. Uh, My life seemed to be tied to institutions. The MBL is and was a great independent organization, and that was a terrific eight years. It was a magnet for some of the best classes, courses each summer, a great summer uh, research uh, institution people. We went from a couple hundred people in the winter to a thousand people in the summer. Great courses, great science. Uh, and it But the model and the problem was that it was wonderful and everything, but we didn't have any endowment to speak of. And so we kind of lived a hand-to-mouth existence. We collected some rent and collected some money from the horses. And so we aggressively uh, worked to raise money. We started a capital campaign, which ultimately reached its goal. Uh, And we built on the loyalty, the amazing loyalty of the scientists in the summer who'd come for a million every year for 20 years. Uh, We built on the strength of the winter program, particularly ecosystem center, but other good year round scientists like Shin Yanaway and others. And then, we raised money and we worked very hard and we uh, came out of it in in good shape. At the end of the time, we had excellent uh, board, really strong board chair, Shelley Siegel. 
And it just was an exciting and great time. How did you find that, you know, sort of fundraising experience? Because, you know, obviously we're moving very far away from, um, you know, certainly research and then also, you know, kind of even away from other sorts of administrative tasks in some senses. Yeah, fundraising, um, first you have to have a good person who does the uh, legwork for you and had a very good director of development at the MBL. I like to talk to people. I enjoy it. Uh, it didn't bother me to ask people for money because I think what uh, I was asking for was worthy of support. We traveled a lot of it with my wife, Sally, who was very, very good at, at this and very personable individual. We traveled all over primarily the East Coast because that's where the money is the, for the MBL, New York. Washington, Florida in the winter. And we made presentations and talked to people and got to know people. And we would get to know people even better in the summer when they were there for three months. So quite frankly, I didn't uh, dislike it. Absolutely. And and what drove your uh, your next move? What was the uh, what was the impetus for, you know, uh, moving along from the MBL? I had uh, we lo- we had very much enjoyed Woods Hall, and we really liked the MBL, but it, we, I guess it was an impetus to try something different. My eldest daughter had gone, was going to, had gone to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, the very fine, small liberal arts college, and she had was enamored of the experience, and I became intrigued by what a great job small liberal arts colleges do in training educating, whatever term, uh, young people to be independent, uh, particularly many of them in science, uh, the hands-on science has taught at those places. Uh, I just thought it was a great model uh, education. So I thought, well, what do I want to try? I want to try something. I'd raise the money at the MBL and, and it was time to try something else. And so, uh, as I said, it was primarily probably the model of, of my daughter's experience at Carleton that said, well, let's look for, look at small liberal arts colleges. Uh, so that's how I sort of uh, then morphed into being a college president at Beloit College. And what was that early experience like? You know, what, what, are, the, what are the first few days on the job, um, you know, when you, when you take on that type of role? <laughs> uh, well, I think, you know, I think most people, I hope most people when they take on a job there is they get to know with whom they're going to work. And so a lot of time working with the faculty, with the students, with the board, uh, small colleges, um, are very personal. Uh, and I think, uh, for some kids, for some students, they're great. And for other students, they're not. But if you want an individual experience where you get to know your professors and things of that sort, that's a a great place to go. And that's really, when you go to a job like that, it all goes back to getting to know the people with whom you're going to work. And that's the students, the faculty, the alums. Um, So there are a lot more hands-on personal sort of work, certainly when you start. Uh, as time progresses, of course, it becomes more uh, rigid in the sense that you've got to do X amount of fundraising and you've got to do Y of this and Z of that. Uh, but when you start, you're just sort of an open book, walking around, learning, meeting people, talking to people, get an idea of what they think is good and what they think is bad, they, what should be changed, what shouldn't be changed, and all those sort of things. What was probably the you know the the biggest challenge if you had to name one um, from that period? Oh, the biggest challenge is, quite frankly, you never have enough funding, never have enough money. Uh, you you're constantly working uh, to balance the costs with what you can charge. Uh, if you look at the 
balance sheets of almost all small colleges, they're tuition driven, but the revenue is, from tuition is not enough to cover the cost. Your fixed costs or your salaries, you know, which are probably 80, I don't know, a while, but 80 plus percent of the, of the operating budget is some sort of a salary cost, maybe a little less than that. And so that means that you're sort of running in place. You're always trying to find um, donations. You don't get grant money, so you have to raise money. Uh, you're also looking at what's essential and not essential. Uh, some There are a few of the small schools that have big endowments, and so that's less of an issue for them. But for 90% of the small schools, and I, I can't conceive of how hard it must be during COVID uh, times, uh, you're just working as hard as you possibly can to uh, be able to both maintain the institution and also change it in the sense that if you're a static institution and nothing is changing, you're going to be left behind and, and they're going to start a spiral down. So it's a case of, you know, kind of making those difficult decisions where uh, you know that some constituency is going to be frustrated with the decision, um, but it's, you know, uh, kind of something you just have to do in order to keep the, um, the organization economically afloat. Yep. Yep. I think that's, and I mean, AIBS, a good example of that, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, you're, you're in a state of constant change, and if you are not constantly changing, you will most certainly be left behind. Yeah. So what was the cause for your, uh, for your next leap? You know, this is obviously to, um, you know, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, and um, where not having an endowment is not an issue. Um, you know, how did that, how did that experience differ, and, and what sorts of things were you doing there? Sure. I had served um, as a chair of one of the Burroughs Welcome Fund uh, advisory committees, the one that looked at funding in North Carolina for pre-college science, uh, technology, engineering, math, STEM education. And I'd done that for a number of years. And, and then I, you know, my term had ended, but I knew about the fund. And I really uh, thought it was doing wonderful work because it uh, had this mission of supporting biomedical research and supporting K through 12 STEM education just in North Carolina. It was a nice balance, a nice organization, a nice place. So when the opportunity arose, I was, I was ready to stop raising money. Though I said I don't mind raising money, I was ready to stop it. I went to the fund. Uh, and a small organization with a, a good sized endowment and able to give away money uh, in a very uh, peer reviewed fashion. I love the way, you know, every money wasn't what I wanted, where I wanted to give it. There were programs, we had uh, very stringent requirements. Uh, and we did peer review. So we'd get 100 applicants and we'd give out 12 awards. And what the fund did is, and does is they would actually bring the applicants to North Carolina and interview them. So they'd bring in twice as many applicants as awards that they were ultimately going to make. So I just liked the process. Uh, my predecessor was uh, had done a really good job in establishing this peer review system and, and the fund had gotten, because the company was sold, the fund got this money from the Wellcome Trust who owned the company. And the Wellcome Trust provided a $400 million endowment and so we didn't have to raise money. Now the Wellcome Trust, you may not know, is a British trust. It's the lar second largest charity in the world after Gates. They probably have thirty billion or something. So they uh, they gave us the four hundred million, and we spun off as a totally independent foundation. Previous to that, it had been part of the company, and the company was sold. Glaxo bought the company, and then uh, so that was so it was total independence. It was a board of uh, 
directors who were all scientists. It was just it was this this wonderful organization in the sense of independence. There was nobody, as we jokingly said, named the boroughs or welcome on the board. Uh, so it was really a very peer-reviewed, careful organization with uh, hardworking staff and a board of uh, scientists with no particular axe to grind. And we had enough money to uh, give away 35 to $40 million a year, which was not huge, but enough to, I think, make a difference. Most certainly. What sorts of, um, you know, uh, projects and, and organizations were you funding during your time there? We were funding individuals within areas. The primary, so we funded people that worked in infectious diseases, and that's, we've done that for many years, and of course that's timely with COVID, but we funded individual scientists, almost all were young, either postdocs or assistant professors in infectious disease. We funded uh, MDs, who were doing research, so physician scientists. We had a program for physician scientists. We had a program for um, quantitative scientists who were uh, doing biomedical research. So by quantitative, that's not quantitative physical scientists, engineers. They had to have a degree in something other than biology, and they were applying it to uh, biomedical research. We funded uh, parasitology. So we chose areas, um, and then we funded young people, junior scientists within those areas, and we included also in the, you know, several other programs. That was the basis. And then the other big program was pre-college science, and there we funded museums and schools in out-of-school learning. So we funded a variety of things in North Carolina in education. And then we had, a, a, I think, a very nice long-term program in diversity where we funded postdocs uh, from underrepresented minorities. So it was a a nice mix uh, from, you know, kindergarten to uh, advanced postdocs, professors, et cetera. Okay, and you know, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about a thread that I've sort of noticed you've developed in our discussion today and has recurred throughout your career, which is the importance of, you know, STEM education. And, you know, obviously for those who are going to pursue, you know, careers in STEM and become, you know, research scientists, et cetera. But also there seems to be an emphasis in many of the things you've done um, on ensuring that the STEM experience is good and valuable for those who are not necessarily going to wind up in one of those careers. And I'm just kind of wondering if that's something that has been a deliberate effort or, you know, if it's just something that's kind of happened along the way. Well, that, that I mean, all they're all absolutely deliberately. I, I've long felt that you have sort of to assume everyone <laughs> is, uh, should and this sounds arrogant, but assume that everyone should know science or STEM. Uh, Understanding that from the beginning, most of those people will not be scientists, will not be mathematicians, will not be engineers. But the fact that they don't pursue a career is not a failure. The fact that they have some comprehension of science, and by that I mean STEM, is an asset for society. I mean, I would, I've always thought that the most important thing is that we not um, say, well, the general public is ignorant. What we say instead is it's our responsibility to provide an education in which understanding of science and by that, I don't mean to run experiments, et cetera, but have comprehension of what science, how it operates, what the scientific method is, uh, some quantitative field, orders of magnitude, things of that sort, so that uh, every U.S. congressman has some field for science, as well as providing programs like I was exposed to in high school, which were pretty sophisticated science and were eight weeks and all that sort of stuff. 
I want all your children <laughs> and my grandchildren and my children to have some feel and understanding of science so that they can uh, not understand all the details about what messenger RNA is, but have some feeling of what is happening, for example, in this vaccine and, and how it's working and how uh, it's protecting us, uh, just as an example, or have some feel for climate change and what human, uh, again, not knowing, not having to know all the details, but just having some feeling of what anthropogenic means and what the sources are and how uh, climate change is being driven. Um, and that that's my Pollyannish goal, but I think that's so important. No, I think that's an excellent answer to the question. Um, and, and now our last one. Uh, do you have any advice for, um, you know, young scientists who are entering the field right now? In, you know, and, and we can expand that out and make it a, into a general STEM question as well. Um, you know, what, what sorts of things should they be thinking about and focusing on? Well, I, I think one of the, there are two things. Number one, and be prepared constantly for change. Uh, if you think... Uh, just of computers <laughs> and the unpredictable that you would have no idea even when I started my career I don't know, 50 years ago or whatever where there were no computers or if there were computers there were computers when I was in college but I mean the 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 day-to-day -day use of computers the fact that I'm holding a supercomputer in my hand right now as I talk to you on the telephone so that's change that that there's constantly going to be change and you have to be prepared for change and adaptation to change and understand that change is coming and change is a constant. And then the other thing, though, is, and I found this has stood me in good stead, if you understand the fundamentals, and this is most pronounced whether it's in biology or chemistry, if you understand sort of the fundamentals that gives you a base in which you can go back to it. If you understand like the fundamentals of chemistry, you can go back to it. Or if you understand uh, some of the fundamentals of biology that haven't changed and defining fundamentals, evolution would be a fundamental in biology, uh, but it's also change. Uh, but if you can educate yourself so you understand the basics, many of the basics, that will stand you in good stead in your career. So be prepared for change, but um, understand some of the core tenets of, of the sciences and the, the scientific method so that you always, when you seem you're swamped by change or whatever it is, you can always go back to those core concepts and figure out uh, what, what may be happening or what is happening. I think that sounds like uh, great advice that we would all be well served by heeding. Uh, Dr. Burris, thank you very much for joining me today. James, thanks a million. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time.